Uh, it's interesting kind of on our topic of conversation, you have a, a certain finite amount of pieces of furniture, you have the people that are in it, you have the different locations. And when you just take everything out of a room and then put it back in, it almost becomes something totally different. So I think today as we're playing with this idea of rearranging the room, uh, kind of your backdrop, I think represents maybe your, you know, what, what's happening with your company even. And not saying that you're playing a plain Jane there, Mr. Mike, uh, <laughs> but it's funny how, uh, how, how just like at home at work, you have all these different pieces and tchotchkes and things to kind of put together to make things go. Um, and uh, it's, it's funny that we get a little snippet into what is behind the scenes on people when they turn the cameras on. Absolutely. Now, now, are we in the process here? I don't see anything with the chat. Um, are we hitting the yeah. go button or we are live? Look at us. We're live. Facebook live. Yeah. Well, we are broadcasting live. We're talking about what's behind us. Everything from neon clouds to pictures of bridges painted on canvas to a very sleek and modern background like Mike has with his white. Now, today we're going to talk about how you build a background as though it's a company. The different pieces, the places, the, uh, mm. the, the different components as they are put together. And we're learning this from a hero. And this is the Scale Up Heroes podcast. You can find all the episodes on scaleupacademy.io. We've got Mike here, we've got Dan, and the conversation is going to be really around um, as a founder and as a co-founder, how does this scaling process happen? So I'm going to sit back. This is what our notes look like now. They will be filled with all kinds of thoughts uh, and I'll be chirping in throughout. But for now, Mike, why don't we get this thing kicked off here on a President's Day and have a... Uh, Let's have a very presidential conversation about growth. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. And uh, first of all, thanks for both of you to being kind of available uh, on the holiday bank to kind of share your own journeys uh, and to have this conversation uh, with our audience. And uh, yeah, we'll be discussing, as you said, the lessons learned by Dan Schiffman, the co-founder at T-Vision uh, Scaling. Division. So then, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. It's a really pleasure to host you uh, on the show. And yeah, let's kick starting by getting to know a little bit more about yourself and uh, what were you doing before you get to Startup Division. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for for having me, uh, Miguel, and uh, and happy to uh, to join uh, El Presidente uh, Miguel on uh, on President's Day. Uh, so. So, you know, T-Vision was a, a you know, in, incredible ride. But before I was at um, T-Vision, I was actually uh, at uh, getting my, my master's in business at MIT. Um, and while I was, I was there, I was working with uh, Amazon on building uh, computer vision based uh, products for Amazon devices. Mm -hmm. um, so think, uh, you know, they have Amazon has a couple products out now that are using computer vision um, to help you buy and discover. And I uh, was also working with a number of professors there on helping commercialize their technology. Uh, but I'm a, you know, entrepreneur uh, since I was uh, nine years old. I started my first company at nine, web hosting company in my parents' basement. And, uh, you know, going to college, uh, computer engineering and economics. And then I got my MBA at MIT. Um, and in between all of that, it's, you know, starting businesses or joining businesses where I get the opportunity to build out a new, a new business or a new business unit and help scale a team uh, for that company. So I've uh, been lucky to have done that in New York, Boston and San Francisco, three of the best cities uh, in the U.S. Um, and uh, and T-Vision is certainly um you know, one of the one of the most, if not definitely the most uh, successful of those companies um, that I founded and and scaled. Well, then, and uh, yeah, tell tell us a little bit more about uh, why did you start uh, T Vision and and by the way, what is T Vision uh, and yeah, yeah, I'll go through it. So, um, so my my, my co founder and I met at MIT uh, in their MBA program, and we were uh, he was coming, he ran a, a, a digital agency. Uh, so uh, in Shanghai and Tokyo, uh, an advertising agency. So they were given budget from, you know, big brands like Unilever and others to uh, spend that advertising in the most effective way on digital channels. But he told me, he said that like, listen, in digital, the campaigns are such a small size 
and there's so many metrics that you're held accountable for, but all the big budgets go to television and there's no data. There's no data to drive these decisions um, and to help you know, um, understand effectiveness and ROI. So uh, he was you know, seeking a co-founder to help him uh, build a solution for uh, what he saw as a big problem that TV, massive medium uh, globally, um, but not a lot of data to drive decisions. So we got together, um, started hashing out, you know, meeting a couple times a week, uh, hashing out strategy and product development and what would this look like, kind of your blue sky discussions. You, I think every co-founder has really early on, right? Uh, you know, what are we gonna do? How's this gonna play out, right? And then you, a lot of times you're like, forget, uh, oh wait, we talked about this like uh, four years ago in a, you know, in a, uh, on a whiteboard. And, um, and then, yeah, we recruited a professor um, from a local university to help us build out. We thought we could use computer vision um, so um, the kind of business and technology that we built, um, you know, uh, is uh, a, the easiest way to explain it for people that understand uh, the concept of Nielsen ratings in the U.S., right? So Nielsen, massive market research firm globally, and then uh, kind of the currency, quote unquote, for TV in the U.S., um, has a panel of roughly 25 to 40,000 homes that use a small kind of clicker um, that notifies the service when they're watching TV and in the room and when they leave. So every time you come in the room, you hit a button. Every time you leave, you hit a button. And one, we just thought the idea of button pressing to notify uh, people when you're in and out of the room was prone to error and we could build a better mousetrap using computer vision. But two, we thought that not only people in room, but also are they actually paying attention to the ad, right? Are they actually looking at it? And is it really a quote unquote exposure? Um, so we built out a, a technology stack uh, of computer vision where we actually can passively detect in real time if a person is in the room and uh, what's on screen and if they're paying attention to that screen second by second without ever transmitting or storing any images or videos. So we, uh, so we started out and, um, and we basically divided and conquered and and I said, listen, if, if you can focus on, and we're all obviously you're spread thin, so we all help each other do everything. But I said, if you can focus on helping get, you know, cameras in people's living rooms, which is fundamentally what, you know, we were doing, uh, although it was passive and anonymous. If you, if we can get, you know, cameras in people's living rooms, I can definitely build a, a commercial business out of this. And um, we got, you know, 15 homes to participate. We got pilots. We, you know, got paid pilots. We transferred those pilots into longer term engagements. We raised our seed round um, and then we continued to grow um, to you know, uh, series A and beyond um, as we established and grew our client base uh, with media owners. So think Disney, Fox, NBC Universal, Turner, um, even Hulu, as well as um, brands. So think P&G, Unilever, um, you know, Bud Light, et cetera. Um, all of them wanted better data to help drive more effective decision-making on television, right? So how do we know when our ads are working? How do we know which ads are not working? Where should we be putting our money based on where our target audience actually pays attention to advertisements? Um, and, you know, with advancements in advertisements, what types of formats are going to be most effective? So we built a you know, originally was a services business, right? To help, uh, well, we don't know how people can use our data, so let's help them use it. And then eventually a data licensing and SaaS business to help answer some of those questions for, for the different stakeholders in advertising. So really played this kind of um, Switzerland role where, you know, we are in between all parties, whether you're buying media or selling media, you can use this data to make better decisions. Well, then I love the Switzerland model uh, benchmark. <laughs> very, yeah. very good, very good one. And and what what is the ad count of the company at this stage then? And uh, how much did you raise? Uh, what are the investors behind? Uh, in what uh, countries are you uh, playing at this stage? So ad count, yeah. metrics, and uh, markets where you are present nowadays. Yeah. Um... Cool. I was just going to check our total. Um, we have right. 75 employees um, mm -hmm. across uh, the U.S., 
uh, and Japan. We also just, uh, you know, the company just launched an, an India office. Um, we've raised roughly $20 million, um, plus or minus, you know, there's, you know, uh, you owe, depending on how you raise, there might be some venture debt, there might be equity. So um, sure. a little over $20 million total. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, about a $10 million business uh, globally, um, and we operated and continue to operate and will expand, but operate in the U.S., um, Japan, and India. Uh, we have two offices in the U.S. We have New York um, and Boston. Uh, we started the company out in Boston. Um, and then we also um, have an office in, in Tokyo, and then we just launched an office in, in India. Um, so in, in, in the U.S., uh, we have Boston was, you know, that was our home base. So when we started out, of course, the, you know, one of the first things you do is you build your technology and operations. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's where our technology and operations are. They're in, they're in Boston. And then, uh, you know, as founders and, and you know, the founders are, are most often, and in this case, we were basically the, num you know, the, the top salespeople, right? Because you have to right. go out and get customers and meet with them and, and acquire them and, and retain them. Um, so we were in New York all the time because that's where the customer base was. So we started an office here and, um, and with, you know, just the two of us and then we hired and now we're uh, just over 20, uh, 20 people in New York. Um, so yeah, New York has actually become more of the HQ for the company at this point. Got it. It's a very interesting point. You just said that you were able to create a 10 million business just for <clears throat> kind of reminding the audience, uh, the ones who have been following us already know these numbers, but uh, to see how difficult it is to really scale a company, only 4% of all companies surpass the 1 million uh, in annual revenues uh, in $1 million. So just 0.4%, the 10 million, so you are already part of this 0.4% uh, in the US. Congrats. All right. All right. And now that, like that. that's the upcoming challenge, I need to push our guests. So it's to get 100 million, which is 0.0198%. Uh, and I'm sure that you guys are on okay. your way and you will get there. So, and if we look to the um, Fortune 1000, uh, which have revenues of 1.8 B plus uh, we have 1000 companies uh, in the US. So uh, very difficult jumps to go, to still get to 1 million, uh, then to get to 10 million, then to get to 100 million and finally to 1B. And after that, even in the pole position, the difference in terms of revenues uh, between Apple or Google, Alphabet and, and Facebook are yeah. kind of, or Amazon are kind of uh, uh, incredible. So. Yeah, I don't want to say numbers uh, in the show, uh, but I was seeing that some of them have kind of the double of the other, even if we compare all of them giants, and they are, but it's it's even uh, more impressing, uh, this kind of number. So congrats for, for that. Thank you, Thank you, you so much. I really like those numbers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take those. 0.04%, <laughs> is, that, is that the number? Did I lose uh, you guys? To, yeah. It, on your side, it, I think that Ryan is uh, on mute, Perfect. but I but I'm hearing you well. Okay, great. And hopefully everyone in the show. We're yes, back. I, I think you had frozen there for a second. So re recap the stats again. What he wants to know from uh, he wants to put a percentage up on the shelf. Uh, it was four yeah. percent and then point zero one percent. Repeat those real quick, Mike. Yeah, so it's 4% to 1 million, 0.4% uh, to 10 million, and 0.00198% uh, or under 0.04% uh, to 100 million. So, uh, which means that 4% get to 1 million. Of those 4%, only 10% go to the 10 million. And yeah. from this... Um, 0.4%, less than 10% go to 100 million. So uh, that, that's the odds uh, of what we are discussing. And that's why this show is called uh, Scale Appearance, <laughs> because it's really, really hard to, to scale a company. I and love that. I'm going to put that up on my wall. <laughs> really? Yeah. 
something to live by, right? I'm only at the 0.4. I need to get to the 0.04. I'm thinking about it every day. Yeah. Just like buying a lotto ticket, you know, that's it. There's, there's a couple million, million, million to one. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Now, I'm, I'm curious, how much of this process do you think you can control? Because we're here talking about scaling, right? How do you get to that, that crazy percentage? Um, it, you know, if you were to say a ratio, how much luck is it as opposed to how much do you have control over? Uh, and as you have these puppet strings as a founder, tell us about that thought process of you feeling whether or not you have control and, and what elements you feel like maybe you've had more control over. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, actually. And I've thought about that a lot in my career as an entrepreneur, because you, you try out some businesses and they, they work, but you, know, you thought they would have grown more quickly. And then you start others that grow so fast. Um, I think the one most uh, impactful piece uh, that is out of your control is timing. Um, you don't like, there are some markets that are, they want your solution today right? Or you're solving a problem that's so important to them right now, they need to buy it. Um, but there's others um, where you're ahead of the game. And that's not the top of their list right now, but it might be two years from now um, or a year from now. Um, depend I'm talking B2B. So, um, so yeah, I think that's actually a really important one that's out of your control that, um, and, and it's not entirely out of your control. I mean, you can, I think that's that's part of what you learn in the customer development process, which is where I was gonna go, what, what is in your control, right? And I think what, what is in your control is all the knowns, which are, you know, who are you executing this business with? What's the problem that you're trying to solve, the solution you have, and, and how much have you learned about the market and the, the, you know, customer and the customer needs and wants and, and those unmet needs so that you can, you know, properly uh, create a solution to their problem and, and articulate it in, in their voice. Also really important, right? So a lot of times I think uh, companies focus so much on the solution, not enough on the problem. So, and you're always, you know, you're always keen to talk about you get the problem and the solution in, in, in your language but you don't want to talk about it in your language. It's the customer's language, right? You want to walk in there and you want to say what they were, you know, what they were about to say, or you want to let them say it. Um, you don't want to be the one pushing a solution. You want to be the one talking about a problem that they understand and, you know, kind of jointly come to the solution that you help build uh, for them. So some you of the are, things that- You are speaking my language. I'll, I'll often tell people that, I don't, I'm sorry, I just don't care what you do. I don't care what your company does. I really care about the problem that you solve. And so this idea of, of positioning the problem as you're growing, when you said that it, it needs to be articulated in their voice, um, yeah. how are you finding out what their voice is? Because you're the person that's creating the data to help these companies make better decisions. What kind of tools are you using to find uh, more information about this problem so you can communicate it in terms that they understand and that actually resonates with them? Yeah, that's so important. Um, we did so much customer development at T Vision. Um, we were in meetings with customers all the time. And I think that is uh, like the most important part of, of building a business. You need to be talking to your customer like they're your best friend and almost every meeting you have is with them. And then you're gonna have to spend nights and weekends, you know, relaying that information back to your team and and bringing them into meetings so they can hear it from you know the horse's mouth. Um, so we did a ton. And then another thing we did early on too that was really important. As interesting, I don't even know if we we mentioned this, Miguel. Um, so one, we brought on a really strong advisory board. Okay, and the way that we did that was very specific to the way we raised our seed round. So we um, raised our our seed round on a platform called AngelList, um, which uh, and they yeah. can do these syndicated angel rounds where we got like, a, I have maybe let's say 50, you know, um, accredited investors who were, um, you know, successful executives in our industry. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we have this 50 people who are like thought leaders, advocates, you know, uh, influential executives in the industry who have in invested in our business and are going to help make introductions, want to see our success. So 
we made we had no shame about reaching out to these people on a regular basis to say, hey, here's a problem we have. Um, do you know someone that could, you know, sit down with us to talk about this problem? Or we think that this customer need is unmet, but we want to talk to an expert. Could you introduce someone? Super valuable um, to leverage those resources. Um, the advisory board uh, was, was uh, you know, it, it evolves over time and your investor base certainly evolves over time. But, you know, knowing what stage you're at and when to tap into what resources and, and how to, you know, be humble and, um, and learn, uh, critical, uh, really critical to this business success. Um, Got it. It's, it's a very good point. And um, you were talking before that, uh, and I think it was also a question from Ryan, that, um, yeah, a lot of this process we can't control, but uh, that, that's really the point is to focus in, on what we can control right. and really don't care about what we can control because we are just wasting uh, our energy. So, and that's why we kind of use a framework called the scaling up framework uh, where we have four pillars people, strategy, execution, cash. And I would suggest that now we will just go through some of the questions that this framework asks to try to understand more uh, your learnings and um, about scaling up your company. So starting with the first one, which is kind of people and assuring that we have the right people um, on the right seats. So uh, what were the main challenges and the main lessons that you learned kind of um, shifting from one organizational design, from the founding team to the, to the leadership team, maybe raising the middle management team. So what were the most tough decisions that you needed to take uh, around people uh, while scaling um, T-Vision until now? Yeah, I would recommend everyone read uh, that uh, book by Ben Horowitz, The uh, Hard Thing About Hard Things. Um, yes. It talks a lot about mm -hmm. this. Uh, I am... Um, and, and, you know, this is personal experience. You're, it's very hard to be the guru of hiring, okay? It's, I think his number is like 50% of your hires are not going to be the right one. And if, if you can find someone who hires 60% of the right people, they're like uh, in the top 1% of performance, <laughs> right? So you're not always going to hire the right people. And I think the people that you need uh, for, you know, that, you know, post-founding team um, might you know, those people might evolve. You might need different types of managers later on. So when we were scaling up from, you know, uh, a, you know, a, we had three people and two interns um, to bringing in, you know, a more robust team. Uh, we looked for people with, uh, who were like a really, a, a breadth of skills and um, who were very adaptive, but had, um, you know, a, could like, basically uh, see the forest from the trees, but could also get into the weeds and get things done. And it's a unique combination. And so we looked for people with uh, certain backgrounds that could fit that uh, profile, as well as we, we relied on our networks to help introduce people. And we found some great folks. Um, you know, as a founder, you're always working yourself out of a job, always, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. constantly you're hiring people and trying to train them to give as much as you can off to them to work on the next thing. Cause the business is constantly evolving, right? You're, and you need to be constantly evolving with the business and your team needs to be taking more and more off your plate. So it's really important to bring on these kind of versatile field players that can um, be player coaches that can, you know, be a pitcher uh, and be a shortstop and be a hitter. Um, and that was really important early on. And, uh, I think all, all founders really enjoy working with those types of people because um, it's, it's very versatile as the business expands. And as many businesses do, you may have to pivot, right? And mm -hmm. you want the type of people that are going to be adaptive enough to, to live through and to help you execute on that pivot. Um, and and, uh, and that's, that's who we hired. And I'm not going to say that we made every right decision, right? You don't go off and you hire 10 people and those are the 10 perfect people. You go off, you hire 10 people and six of them are awesome and four of them, you know, may or may not work out. Um, but you, you have to kind of push through those things and uh, set up as we did um, some very specific uh, milestones and start creating your own like scorecards and grids and process for hiring so that you don't 
you, you can you don't make those mistakes and that you hire the best people that are going to grow with your organization got it uh, and that that's a very good point that you just said uh, it's inevitable that we will kind of uh, go through mistakes hiring people so yeah. the most important thing is not about uh, making the wrong decision but about what you do after you made the wrong decision so uh, are you getting much more uh, comfortable nowadays kind yeah. of correcting a wrong decision about hiring? Because sometimes I would say, uh, even thinking about myself, I would take too much time and try to recover uh, that person and do everything that I can before uh, kind of having the final conversation and saying, this is not working. Uh, yeah, I know. It's so funny. <laughs> uh, um, I, one, I, say, I would say, one of the toughest things and it's different for different people is knowing when to like sometimes you got to cut losses right so um maybe you you made a, a the wrong decision um, but you need to set up some guide posts to let you know and to to notify yourself hey this was a wrong decision right and it's actually really important as you're scaling a company because you don't want a bad decision to take down your business You don't want a bad decision to slow your growth for 12 months. Um, you want a bad decision to be recognized as a bad decision early, and then you want to take uh, actions to fix. Um, so we would, you know, that, and that's what we used a, uh, you know, we, we developed our, our hiring framework. We created a rubric around what we thought and then what we saw was most successful with people. And then we created a, a training timeline with, um, you know, it was like a, a six to eight week long training program with a, actual um, kind of tests, really. Uh, they were exams. And, um, you know, we would conduct those exams and we would review. They weren't multiple choice tests. It was like, um, but uh, you had to create, you know, in the terms of a sales team, you had to write up a proposal for this RFP. Mm -hmm. And then you have to present that proposal uh, and submit the documentation on a certain date. And if we see that a person is not where they should be, we take corrective action to try and build them up. And then at a certain time, there's there's guideposts set up where you say, okay, you know, this isn't this isn't the right fit. And I think that's really important to do for for the employer and the employee. Very again, very interesting. And that was kind of uh, jumping in my mind or circulating in my mind something around uh, de-risking the process of um, yeah. execution that is so important on scaling up versus starting up where experimentation is much more um, important. But when we are really scaling and trying to be that category leading um, player, we we can't uh, we can't have one or two quarters lost because of five or 10 uh, misfits in terms of uh, hiring the wrong people. So this will completely kill um, our scale. So we are just talking about this just to see how important uh, it is to really be able to take quick decisions, even if they are wrong and correct them as soon as possible. Yeah. So jumping to strategy and assuring that we are all focused on if we already have the right people on the right seats in the team so now we need to assure that they are focused on on the right priorities so i know that you have a model to kind of assure yeah. that everyone is aligned and that you bring the the main priorities for for the team so what is the model that that you use yeah um so we basically i, I work with each of my uh managers And we, we go through this process where we, we set up um, this, this grid um, and we, we look at the mission, um, uh, strategy, goal, the tactics, mm -hmm. how do we measure success? Um, and that's the main buckets. We also think about who the customer is because sometimes that customer is internal, sometimes it's external mm -hmm. and, and where your team's responsibility is. And as you, As you go through that process um, of, you know, what is the, the, the mission, right? What is the strategy that's going to help us achieve that mission? What are the goals that we have, um, specific goals, right? Like, is it customer satisfaction? Is it um, growth? Is it retention? Is it customer acquisition? What are the tactics, right? Are we going to use email campaigns? Are we going to create uh, some type of report? Um, you know, what are those tactics? And then how do we measure that success? 
And going through that process with your team is vital, um, really. Like, um, it helps align everyone. And what it also enables you to do as a, as a leader and a founder is to kind of come to terms. You almost want to like sign that that sheet with your, your, your manager, your leader and say, all right, this is, you know, your, this are your marching orders, align your team with this. I'll see you in six months. And it's not exactly how it goes. Right. But ultimately you want to be able to have hands off and to trust your people to be executing to a strategy that is going to help grow the company. And by going through that process, and sometimes it can be uncomfortable, um, but it really is crucial and enables you to scale. Uh, Cause you know, those people can now be independent. They have marching orders. They have, um, they have a mission and strategy and goals that they can communicate with their team. And they know that everything I should be doing should align to this grid. Got it. And um, yeah, again, uh, assuring that we have, that we are all focused on, on the right priorities. And so now it's, it's really time for um, execution as we were discussing uh before and uh, inside execution, we have here some very interesting points. And um, assuming that I, I, would, I would say that a lot of scale ups or a lot of startups face this transition uh, before scaling from going from a services business and kind of they are growing and gaining momentum in a service perspective, but they need to find out the product which is really scalable and to prove the investors and to the market that they can really scale the business. Um, worldwide and make it really big. So I know that you have a, an amazing case study here and amazing learnings to, to share with the audience, which is you, have, you were able to go from 20 to 80% in yeah. recurring revenue and do the yeah. transition from a services business to a product business or to a subscription right. business in just one year. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about, about the process and what were the main learnings for the ones who are kind of struggling or uh, going through this challenge uh, of going from a services to a product business? Yeah, and, and let me preface this with, I, I am not opposed to services businesses, right? So um, in, in uh, investors, <laughs> uh, so I think services businesses are great. Uh, they can be very successful. I think some businesses might want to stay services businesses. Uh, in today's climate, I think you get, uh, there's a multiple, right? Investors like uh, SaaS businesses, it's more predictable. It helps you build a business behind it, right? Um, you don't want to be in a business where you're always pitching um, for, uh, for, for money because it's hard to scale uh, that type of business. Um, so, so um, but we did take our, our services, we were about 80%, uh, we were 80% services, actually more than 80%. And we ended the year about, you know, 75% um, SaaS. And uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, you know, I went back to, I talked about customer development earlier, and I think that is the most important piece. You need to spend so much time with your customers. And it's not just about um, trying to, you know, fit your solution into their portfolio or try and pitch them how your solution addresses their problem, but it's understanding what is the core root cause of the problem you have, right? And if I, and when we were a services business, we were out there saying, hey, you know, what problems do you have? We'll help you with our data to solve those problems, right? Because it's new data, you've, you've never used this before. It's gonna be hard for your team to, to take this on. And we built a services business like that. And then we realized that across, you know, our 15 or, or so customers at the time um, that they were all, you know, a lot of these questions were being answered in the same way. And so we built out a platform, like a dashboard platform mm -hmm. that with our, you know, with our syndicated data. So you have live streaming data, populating a dash, an analytics platform, dashboard platform that would be self-service. So they could help answer these questions on their own. And the, the services piece, I think, was really important in, in T-Vision's um, growth because we needed to establish credibility, right? We needed to show them that we had data, that we had team, that we had a solution that would help solve their problems. And the services component was critical to help them do that. And then once you build that credibility, right, then you start migrating to, hey, we can actually train your team to uh, get even more in the data, to use this more frequently, to have more success with it on a platform. And we can provide that same white glove service 
but more as a support to your, um, to your access to the platform. And uh, we were successful in converting all, all of our customers actually from that services model over to the subscription model. That, that's a, an amazing uh, case study and very, very difficult to, to do. It seems, it seems easy from your words, but I know that the challenge about customer uh, discovery is, uh, and customer development is, is much more difficult than what it is. So yeah, uh, for sure. And, and um, we also kind of discussed that um, before preparing this, this call uh, earlier this week in, in New York, about the importance of going through silos in terms of execution. So when the company typically gets to, I would say, 40, 50 people, you start having very strong silos and it's difficult to connect the different teams um, around the same priorities. Again, coming back to, to the strategy yeah. component of, uh, of the framework. And everyone is looking to the company through a different lens and through their different functions. And sometimes uh, we talk a lot about this on engineering side. We want to do the, the something that excites us and not something that the customers want and something that bring business to, yeah, to, sure. to the company. So which, which is very difficult uh, to kind of motivate people around. Yeah, you don't need something so complex because that's not what the client is um, is asking uh, at all. Right. So you, have, you also brought to the team this kind of... Um, quality, let's say, and, and this link between products and sales, between understanding, having, having the instinct to develop the product and at the same time to develop the product based on the inputs that your customers have, having those conversations um, with them. Why this is, this is so important and why do you think this, this was so important um, scaling uh, T-Vision? Yeah, so on the one hand, I think as you scale up and we certainly, um, you know, you, you don't, uh, I wish I, I had someone kind of giving you this advice uh, early on, but you definitely, you, you need a customer advocate in every meeting. You really do. It uh, doesn't matter who it is um, uh, and what team it is, you need a customer advocate in the meeting. Um, it's critical. And that means that, you know, there, there have to be people across the organization that are, that are in touch with uh, the customer or in touch with people that are in touch with the customer and have that customer voice. It's super important. Um, so that's one definite recommendation, especially trying to scale an organization across New York, Boston and Tokyo and now India, um, real challenge. Um, and, you know, trying to keep that uh, voice consistent across regions and trying to keep our execution aligned with our strategy cost reasons also really, uh, really difficult. So communication is, is um, paramount, um, and uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's most of what I, I honestly think is is really critical about that. Bringing together product and sales, um, I think, is you, you want to get people because engine, you know, an engineering um, organization is, you know, depending on leadership and culture, um, you know, they they tend to. Uh, communicate like engineers, right? Engineers communicate like engineers. They want facts, they want um, logic and truth. So when you, uh, you want to, as you're looking, we talked about people, you do want to get people um, that can be those kind of customer champions um, who can speak the language of the engineers, right? And that either means that you, you want to get people that can kind of help communicate cross-functionally uh, within the organization from engineering to analytics to marketing to sales. But it also means that you want to get good leadership in place on a product perspective, from a sales perspective that can help bridge that gap. So like, for instance, one of the things we did at T-Vision was we had a weekly um, uh, product review meeting where basically every single salesperson um, uh, would would join as well as some people from customer success. So the, the services and, and, and uh, support teams and product was a facilitator. And the entire purpose of the meeting was to capture feedback from the customer on a regular basis. And the reason that, you know, products lead would, would take that is because, you know, his responsibility was to take that feedback 
right, as it was given, synthesize it, and then make sure that that was incorporated into product roadmap and development, but also communicated to the engineering team to drive prioritization, to drive development, right? So maybe we don't need to build the Rolls Royce. Maybe we can build the Honda Civic um, because you know what the, the Rolls Royce version is something that we're going to need down the road, and and the market doesn't require that today. Got it. Uh, that's another interesting point on the execution side, which which we call uh, in the framework the meeting rhythms. Uh, that's what you are just saying, uh, assuring that there is a, a regular moment in the different areas of the company uh, that. Uh, facilitates the communication going through all the areas of the company and connecting the different functions and aligning around priorities and kind of um, repeating uh, every single time before we start the meeting, what is our vision? What is our big area of issues goal? What is our mission? What are our free rocks or priorities for the quarter? And what are we discussing this week that will help us move forward on those priorities? And the conversation stops being around product, around sales, around finance, around it's how can we all contribute as a team to get closer to our quarterly goals that will get us closer to our midterm goals and to our um, BAC. And I assume, again, it's communication and around international expansion. Um, uh, this would be one of the main challenges. If we don't have this regular meetings and we don't have them in an effective way, it would be very difficult to have uh, everyone on, on the same page. So uh, maybe that, that's a kind of an affirmation, but I uh, will turn it in, into a question, uh, which is um, how, how do you leverage meetings to kind of align the offices in New York, Boston, um, uh, Japan and now uh, with India and especially and th this is very very interesting uh, we see now uh, kind of Asia competing with uh, with the US and uh, or, or let's be more specific China I know that you have stronger operations in in, in Japan um, but that's very different cultures and I, I would say that something that attracted me a lot about your funding team is that you have this both perspectives in your funding team, which is kind of yeah. very rare. And I think that's the way. Uh, it's not about competition between US and China. It's how can we really create amazing companies uh, together? Yeah. So on the, on the first thing, I think diversity is super important. You want a diverse team with diverse perspectives. Um, that will help you grow faster. It'll help you see things from a different perspective. It'll help you understand how to more effectively communicate. Um, so really important. Uh, we were lucky to build a really diverse team. Um, I think the, the other, so you asked about regular meetings. Um, yes. I'll get there in just a moment. Um, Got it. <laughs> uh, I, I also, um, I also think when you're building an international organization, right. And you're trying to not only start up, but then scale up with multiple offices in multiple countries and multiple languages, um, you, you need to do a lot to ensure that um, you're getting like even materials, right? Like, you know, so, you know, between Japan and US, we're sharing, you know, proposals back and forth. We even hired someone in Japan who does translations into English so that um, we could, you know, send Japanese sales and, and customer materials and proposals to the US so that we could see what was going on there and vice versa, we would do the same. Uh, for them. Uh, so that's one, you know, not a regular meeting, but more of like an ongoing thing where um, when you're dealing with multiple cultures and, and, uh, and languages, you need to ensure that that is all aligned. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the same business. We got the same tagline, right? We're, uh, we're pitching the same solution and solving the same problems. Um, on that note, though, you do end up encountering some differences. Uh, and those are key to note. So the Japanese advertising market is very different than the US advertising market. So you have to learn what to take um, and, and use and adopt and what to leave. Um, so from a strategic perspective, you need to understand the differences between these markets and where those markets are going. And then from an execution perspective, you need to know what to take to help adapt your you know, uh, tactics um, and what to leave. 
Um, so that that also is really important. And then on the regular meetings, you know, we have um, I, I um, you know I think you developed a great framework, uh, the scale up framework. And, and one of the things I was noticing in here that we that we do okay. um, too is you know you have to, your teams have to have regular meetings, and that means they have to have standups, whether it's once a day or a couple times a week, to check in on what everyone's working on and ensure they're aligned with goals. You also um, should have meetings across your management team at a regular cadence so that, you know, one, that you make sure that people are getting along, right? Because you, you would never want a situation where one team's impediment is, you know, preventing another team from succeeding. And then, uh, so that's also really important. And then, you know, regular offsites with the leadership and, and top management, critical, um, and, and getting these, these cross-team collaborations as well. So we would have, our teams had stand-ups almost every day. Um, uh, certainly the engineering team has them every day. Um, and then uh, we would have, you know, regular cadence meetings to help uh, ensure that we had, you know, cross-team and, you know, intra-team uh, communication and collaboration. It's, you got to figure it out. It can be different for every organization. It depends on the people. I actually do believe that you should start off with some rigid framework and then see where your organization may take that framework and adopt it to, to their culture. Very important point. That's, uh, it's, it, it's something interesting that we took almost, uh, I would say, 80% of the conversation around execution. And that's really one of the main challenges around scaling up um, a company. So we will not cover too much cash today. That's also a good excuse to have done again in the show um, later to go deeper uh, into another uh, component of, of, uh, yeah. of the framework. And uh, cash is one of them. How do you should that to have the uh, appropriate level of cash flow to scale your business? Um, so and let's kind of wrap up with uh, one of our favorite questions in the show, uh, which is uh, if you would be starting again, um, Division today, uh, what advice would you give to yourself? Yeah, um, be humble, um, be adaptive, and um, you know, take a step back every once in a while. Critical for an entrepreneur you're always in the business, you're always working, you're always executing and thinking about the strategy. It's really important to take, you know, a uh, step back, take a long weekend and just say, hey, you know, why are, why are these people doing these things? What's really happening? You know, how was I perceived in this scenario? And to make sure that, you know, you're, um, that you're executing the right way. And I think it's really important to take a step back and reflect um, also really important uh, to set up those guideposts, as I mentioned earlier, so that you, when you make a wrong decision, you know it's the wrong decision as fast as possible. Got it. That's a very good point. Thank you so much, Dan, for so much value. And uh, word back to, to Ryan. All right. Yeah, thank no, you. It's, been, it's been fun listening in. And uh, our clean piece of paper turned up all kinds of little things here. And Awesome. As I was listening, you know, how do you package all this together? Because you're really talking about something that's very dynamic. You're talking about people, strategy, execution, cash, uh, all of these variables that would happen within it. So the three things that kept coming to mind, um, specifically because, Dan, you said one of the most underestimated things is the time. I thought to myself, time, treasure, and talent. We hear that all the time. That is what you're able to bring to the table. So from what I got out of this today is that if you are a founder, you essentially have those three elements. You have time, treasure, and talent. And all of these elements that we're talking about scale up can fit within one of those. Time being maybe one of the most crucial. Where are you investing your time? Uh, what systems do you have in place to be effective with your time? Um, how are you utilizing rigid strategy, uh, cross-functional teams, from a timing perspective. I think that's really key. So you've got the time veil. Second is treasure, right? You've got everyone from investors to what I see as treasure in this situation is the data. What kind of gold can you find in the pockets of your customers and how are they willing to get rid of it based primarily on the problem that's being solved? How do you get the right currency of that treasure so that people are speaking the same language? And then finally, if it doesn't fit into time or treasure, I see it fitting into talent because I love this idea that as a founder, we're always trying to slowly replace ourselves. 
and the bottlenecks start, uh, they're always at the top. And so if you are the type of leader that can't hire the right talent, can't mobilize the right team, can't bring people in, then you will be that bottleneck at the top. So as I look over this entire process, time, treasure, and talent holds true to the, the scaling and the growth process. But where are you investing your time? What treasure are you finding, giving, receiving, or evaluating? And at the end of the day, what type of talent can you bring? Because let's face it, going from two to three people to 75 people, if you look at the difference between you then and you now, the talent that you bring, 75 amazing people together to really take it to that next level, still keeping them within their lanes, but having them add to the treasure and having them be effective with time, uh, I just kept going back to that. So for those of you who enjoy these types of insights from experts, we have them each week here on the Scale Up Heroes podcast. You can find us at the scaleupacademy.io. Uh, and hopefully these conversations just spark enough interest for you to dive deeper. Because what amazes me is at the end of the day, it's so refreshing, Dan, to, to hear you say it's all about the problem that you're solving. It's about having a clear solution. It's about knowing your market. And we can say that over and over and over again, but it's not until you really dig down, get into the minutia, find out where the notes are in between the notes that the magic starts to happen. And that's why it's so deceiving. It seems like it may be simpler, but as we know, you've got this 4% who make it to 10 million, 10% of that make it to hundred million, and then 0.019 something, something, something makes it up there. <laughs> so think about this, we're playing the percentages, we're playing the odds, and it's, it's in making decisions with our time, talent, and treasure that it all happens. Whew. Thank you. The numbers are going on my wall, Miguel. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks again. I, I can send you uh, even better later by email. Okay. <laughs> so it be Great. easier to kind of post them on the wall. Thank you so much. Enjoy all right, everybody.